Our next speaker is Ryan Brigante. Oh, I don't know if I'm saying that right. He is a 37 year old man living with Kleinfelter syndrome, 47 XXY. In 1985, his parents learned via amniocentesis that he was going to be born with Kleinfelter syndrome, non-mosaic 47 XXY. He was told at nine years old. The first time he Googled Kleinfelter syndrome was in June of 2017. And a few months later, he started living with XXY YouTube channel. In November 2019, they became an official nonprofit organization. Fun fact, before starting living with XXY, he was a chef for 10 years, graduating from the Culinary Institute of America in 2007. He has had multiple careers since, including freelance action sports photographer, and he loves spending time with family, snowboarding, camping, and hiking. Please welcome Ryan. Hello. Can you guys all hear me? Okay. Um, this is my first time ever doing something like this um, outside of living with XXY, my community. So um, it's I'm, my heart rate's like at 130, but I'll, I'll be I'll be good. Um, so kind of let me let me go back a little bit. So when my parents, uh, my, my mom was 42 when she had, when she was pregnant with me. My dad was 50. Um, back then, over 40 was considered geriatric or high risk. And so they did an amnio. Um, they later found um, the results that I had, Kleinfelder syndrome, XXY. Um, my mom told me about when they were pulled into uh, the doctor's office. Um, they, they had a really awful experience with the doctors, um, especially back then when there was no information. There was only one research paper out of Denmark um, and it was in like the medical libraries with the internet didn't exist back then. And so when my parents left that, um, when my parents left that meeting, they looked at each other and they said, well, we're not perfect. So why do we expect our son to be Go, going through, going through this, um, has been definitely, um, it's been, it's, so there have been some hard aspects of having a lot, like having life with a genetic condition, but I've always embraced the positive. And that's why I started this organization. So. My parents went home, raised me, did what they could, um, learned learned as much as they could about uh, Kleinfelder syndrome back in the day. And then they told me at the age of nine. And when I was told at nine, I just accepted it. It was like, okay, this is me. This is what makes me, me. And, and um, that's, that's about it. And then I started, um, I, okay, so I had like IEPs. I had um, like learning challenges with English, reading, writing, spelling. I, so I had I had the help in school, and then around thirteen is typically back then. There was my doctor didn't really have any information about testosterone, and so I started testosterone around thirteen. That was a new experience, um, a new beginning. I pretty much lived my life. So other than the challenges in school, high school is probably the hardest aspect. I was also like a foot taller than everyone else, and granted. People bullied me back then for being tall. I was bullied a lot, but it wasn't because I had an extra chromosome. It was just because I stood out. And when kids stand out, that's that's what happens. I wouldn't go back and change the fact that I was bullied because it's made me who I am today. It's made me resilient in my own field with, with the bullies in my own community. It's made me, it, it just made me who I am today. And so basically kind of moving that forward, doing testosterone, I definitely noticed a lot of growth and, and um, like I'm able to grow a beard, just all the benefits of, of TRT and kind of where I, where I stand now is, let's see. So high school was difficult. And then basically what I did is I just did my shots. I went to my doctor every six months and then I just lived my life. And I did that throughout my entire, from 13, despite my challenges I had, I, I graduated a 2.0 student at a high school because I knew because the way I learned was different. I'm very kinetic, hands-on, right-brained. Like you give me something where I can take it apart, or or like cooking, like chef. And we excel in those environments. Um, and so I went to culinary school, and I just continued to live my life. Um, dating in my early 20s was. Let me let me take it back a little bit. So, um, oh, I've I've never done this, so I'm just gonna go off verbatim, right? That's how that's a that's how I roll. No, no slides. That stuff to me is, no. but, um, so 
my parents, when they, when, when they found out I was sterile at 13, when starting testosterone, they talked about fertility and they always just told me I could adopt because that's what was available back then. And so they normalized adoption and they normalized the fact that we had someone in our family that was adopted. And so that just became something that was like my cousins, my family, like everyone knew that I had Kleinfelder syndrome and everyone was supportive about it, especially when it came to the fertility aspect. And that's a big thing in our community that I'll talk about later. But so normalizing adoption for me was like, okay, if I want to have kids, I can adopt. And so moving forward into my early 20s in, in the dating world, a lot of, you know, a lot of people that might have a genetic condition where you're infertile, um, you, you don't know how that's going to, like how dating is going to go because everyone wants kids, supposedly. And so... <laughs> um, and so I just was honest and open about my diagnosis with people right up front, right when I met them. And I would just say, hey, I have this genetic condition. It's called XXY because a lot of people don't like the word syndrome. It's, it has like a negative connotation to it. And so um, I would just tell people I couldn't have kids. Um, and women, some women would be like, okay, I want my own kids. And then other women, their eyes lit up. I don't need to explain anything more. Um, <laughs> So I went, I went into dating, I went into dating and I went into my life with optimism, with positive, with, with knowing my strengths instead of focusing on my weaknesses. My parents never raised me to, you know, yeah, I had challenges and I've had to work three times harder than everyone else in my life. Um, and so moving forward, you know, I, I went from, I went to culinary school in Hyde Park, New York, which was one of the most prestigious culinary schools at the time. I worked in the fine dining industry, white tablecloth, dinner only restaurants, uh, for 10 years, ranging from New York, Nantucket, Colorado, San Diego. Um, I've, I had extreme, like, I was, I was really talented at what I did. I had a lot of fun. It wasn't stressful for me. Um, doctors diagnosed me with ADD or ADHD when I was a kid, but um, that, in that environment, you excel because you have to do, you have to multitask and you have to, like, remember things and a lot of a lot of the restaurants we work in, you don't have tickets that you read. They just call out the the food, and you have to remember it. Um, and so, kind of moving forward in my life, my early twenties, um, I lived back in San Diego after after graduating from culinary school and working in different environments. And then in two thousand seven, after let's see, two thousand two thousand nine, I uh, moved to Vail, Colorado, and I worked in a really high end restaurant there. Um, and then I left the culinary industry for photography. I was snowboarding a lot. And a lot of my friends were professional snowboarders and kind of my life just drifted into this other creative avenue. Um, I was able to do it for five years. I moved from Vail to Salt Lake City, Utah, um, where I kind of excelled in, in the action sports, mainly snowboarding, mountain biking, and skateboarding. Um, and I just used my, my talents that I knew that I was good at these things and I knew I, I could learn by doing. And so that's, that's kind of like what I did. Um, so kind of fast forward, 2017, um, I, I was working for a digital tech company at the time and there was a conference in Denver, Colorado at the, um, I don't know how to, I, I, I mispronounce a lot of words, but one of the hospitals there was having a, a conference for X and Y variations. And my parents asked me, they said, do you want to go? And then my mom, my mom looked at me and she said, you might learn something and you might be able to teach some people something. And I had never Googled it at this point. I've been just living my life, knowing my, knowing my challenges, doing my testosterone injections once a week, um, and just kind of going about life. And so I went to this conference and going, going to this conference was, it, it, it changed the trajectory of my life. Um, I met people for the first time that had XXY. I met about 20 individuals. Most of the individuals, the, especially the older guys, um, were victims. And, and parents were teaching their kids to be a victim, that you have a disability, you can't do this, um, you're infertile, you'll never be able to have kids. It was, it was looked, a lot of these guys were like, thought that they were looked down upon by society. And so I met, I met one guy named Andy. And Andy is a 55-year-old farmer in Salem, Oregon. Um, he understands the aspect of hard work and having to, doesn't matter how much time it takes you, doesn't matter, like, it, it doesn't matter. It's that if you have a goal or you have, you have the aspiration in life to get something done, you do it regardless. And, you know, when you have bullies and stuff growing up, they tell you no, they, everyone tells you you're not going to be successful, all these things, you don't listen, like, 
that just drowns out and you just focus. And so going to this conference, you know, when the doctors, basically they separated the parents and then they had like an adult, um, a little adult retreat group on the side. And I remember sitting in this conference room with 300 people that was like stacked down. And when they, they did a call out um, at the conference to have all the men stand up and go to this, com this room. And I was like, my parents were like nudging me, like stand up, go. And I was like, uh-uh, not getting up. Because it made me, it made me think about back, back when I had an IEP in high school, how I had to get up in front of the class to then leave the room with my test so I could have extended time. And while everyone's looking at you like, well, why do, why do you get extended time? But you don't really know how to tell people like, well, this is why. And so I went to this room after that was over and I started talking with all these guys and just getting to know them. A lot of them thought I was a researcher or a doctor because I had a computer out because I was taking notes because I would, I'd never met anyone before. Um, and when the doctors came in to talk to us, it was a very interesting kind of, they felt like they knew more than the guys living with the living with it. And they were like, kind of not, not that they were talking down, but they were, they were trying to educate us with what research papers they, that, that are online and all of that stuff. And so after the, after the two day conference meeting people, I've, I've made a couple of lifelong friends there. Um, I Googled it for the first time. I went on my phone and I typed in Kleinfelder syndrome and a photo popped up. And if any of you, the photo no longer exists. Um, it was something that our organization was able to remove, but it was a, um, an illustration of a man standing with his hands on his hips with glasses, square face in his bedroom, a lot of camastia, um, no, no facial hair or no facial hair, no body hair. Um, these are, a lot of these are like the classic traits of Kleinfelder syndrome. Um, even though only about 35% of our community will have glatocomastia at some point in their life. And so even though the representation was like, well, why does he wear glasses? Like glasses is already a stigma and people that have glasses know about that, like especially growing up. And so I just, I, the research company I was working for at the time, I just dove into research. I read every article I could find on PubMD. I, did, I didn't even know that existed. And I was blown away by the information online. And it just fueled my fire to create a YouTube video, um, to put myself out there. And working behind a camera, you never wanna be in front of the camera. It took me 42 tries to make my first YouTube video. Um, shortly after I got an email from a mother in Switzerland and I took it to my mom and my sister isn't the most emotional person, but the emails made my parents cry, my sister and my mom cry. It was basically a mom from Switzerland was told to terminate um, told that this is, um, you know, better, better try again. And that's something that a lot of mothers in our community here is um, terminate. And she found the video. She found someone that was just like normal, but I'm, I don't quote myself as normal. Um, I don't, I don't really like that word, but that's what, how people say it. Um, and she kept her, she kept her son. And so that was kind of like the trajectory of my life had changed with that one video, with that one email. And ever from that going forward, I've met over 600, 603 guys in Poland, um, Australia, New Zealand, and then here in the United States, guys and kids of all different ages. Um, the oldest is 75. The youngest is like, basically, I've met a family right after they took their son home from the hospital. Um, and so kind of, I know I'm kind of like all over the place, but um, so with that being said, like the organization had changed, like the YouTube videos had changed my life. I put myself out there. I, I, everything I read online, I was like blown away by it. I was like, there's gotta be other guys out there like me. Like I'm not the only one that's this way. And so I, can't, I became on this quest. You know, when you're a chef, you love food. So I, I decided like, I'm gonna travel and try to meet as many people as I can. So I did meetup groups through Facebook on the East Coast, San Diego, um, in Australia and Sydney, um, Melbourne and um, Brisbane. And then I did some in um, New Zealand as well. And I've met so many different kinds of people, all walks of life, all jobs, PhDs, masters, um, like electricians, photographers, like every job that's already out there in like normal society is within, is within our community. And so one of the things that after starting I kind of got to this point where so many people were contacting me and 
I, I had funded, I told myself that I'm going to fund myself for four years to do this, that I'm going to spend my own money for four years. I budgeted everything out. And in 2019, after three weeks of applying for a nonprofit organization status, we received it. And so it, it, there, that, began, uh, that began a new journey. So starting living with XXY, um, I have a genetic condition and um, I think it's been, it's definitely been eye-opening for a lot of people to see people in our community come out. Living with XXY has created a safe space for people with XXY to open up and share their story. Um, everything that you see online, the photos, the, the stick figure drawings, the, you know, the large waist, the, the glottochromastia, the extra X chromosome that makes you more feminine. There's, there's so much stuff that's riding against people that have um, XXY. And so it created a place where people like me and other men like me and families that wanted to open up, it gave them a place to share their story. And so in 2021, we did an annual report and hundred out of a hundred, I'm sure there were more, but 115 families contacted me personally throughout that year and told us that what we're doing has, has decided, they decided to keep their kid and not terminate. And I know that genetic counselors are some of the first line of, if, if their OBGYN doesn't deliver the horrible in, the information in a horrible way, usually, then it's genetic counselors that are next. Um, and so I just wanted to come today to give people the opportunity to ask me questions. Um, your questions matter because I think in this world where all of your learning is through books that are where there's outdated information on Kleinfelder syndrome, where there's research studies that involve maybe 30, 40 guys that are part of that research, then you learn about that. It's not, it doesn't depict the entire community. Our community is a spectrum. And what you see online and what you read about it in school is not necessarily the right, not the right, but not the entire aspect of our community. And so it's really important for people to see lived experiences, successful experiences, the hardships that families have, but to know that like this life is worth living. And like everyone that has this genetic condition, it's, it makes us different, but it's good to be different, especially nowadays. And some of the positive aspects of this is like obviously being right-brained and hands-on, but a lot of us are really kind and caring people. And we, we bring a lot of empathy. And granted, a lot of people do take advantage of that, but we're, we, we're always just kind of giving that empathy out. And so to this date, we have a podcast, we have um, a YouTube channel, we have a blog series where we're sharing people's biographies about their life. Um, and then we do meetups. And it's something that um, there, if, if you take out your phones, everyone has Instagram and you type living with XXY, you give us a follow, you'll see all the amazing kids, babies, guys, adults getting their masters, getting their PhDs, um, graduating high school, just what you would see in normal life. And that's kind of like what we bring to the table is we just, we're just here and we exist. And they say it's like one in 500 to one in 650, but only 25% of us get diagnosed at some point in our life. And so my goal in my lifetime is to increase that number and to give every single mother that's getting a non-invasive prenatal test a chance and not just be delivered the horrible information that they are. And unfortunately, there's not enough um, research in the doctor and medical community for this to happen. So that's kind of like why I'm up here standing up here today is to be like, living with X6Y is gonna be around. Um, we're, we're making a difference already. And the more and more people that know about what we're doing, they can, they can take that information to their newly diagnosed patient and be like, hey, look, here's people that have this diagnosis. You can talk to people. You can see what they've done, you know, and and you can you can change that trajectory of that mom that's thinking about termination or that's being told to terminate through the lack of information that's out there. So I think I've got 13 minutes left. So I think questions. There's a lot of you, so there's there can be a lot of questions. And I'm an open book. My whole life is online. So thank you so much. I have a question. And you spoke about this a little bit already. And I think a lot of us know this, that 
a lot of the research that people Google and look up about XXY is really old. It's done in you know really specific populations of people who are symptomatic. And now we're entering an era when a lot of these people are getting NIPT. And going forward, there's gonna be so many more people who have these, not just XXY, but other sex chromosome conditions that were diagnosed prenatally from a blood test. So how do you see the just society going forward where so many more people are going to have that information? Again, no symptoms, you know, diagnosed as an infant. You know, how do you see that going forward? I tell people we're on a race against time. Um, the information in our community is not changing fast enough. And, and it starts with our community. Our community has to find the safe space to open up. A lot of families will be like, well, um, we're told not to tell our son until before he starts testosterone. And so it's treated as this, like, it's almost like the birds and the bees topic where no one wants to talk about it, but it's coming. And so, and it, and it's like, why drop the bomb on your son a week before he starts testosterone? It's like what we're encouraging people to do is educate their kids at a young age. Like tell them at two that they have an extra X. So give them age appropriate information as they, as they grow up and getting people in our community, the safe space to where they can open up and talk about this because we're hiding in plain sight. If I was to walk around without this, or most of you that do know me might be able to recognize, but like you would never know that I had a genetic condition. And so it starts with our community giving, like showing them that it's the, the power of opening up can change lives, change information. More donations come to nonprofits like ours, then we're able to give back to our community, potentially do research in the, in the future, and then change that information. Because you're, you're right, non-invasive prenatal testing is something that most people are doing. And if the information is continuing to stay old and outdated, more and more families, most likely, in, in our opinion, are going to terminate because they, that information is not out there showing that, hey, we're happy. Like most of the families are like, what is my son going to be happy? And it's like everyone has problems. Everyone, like just because you find out the problems at birth, that you, you're kind of given a crystal ball in a way where you, you can kind of navigate those problems as if they start to arise. And so I think just give, getting, doing this and getting our community showing them like hey it's okay to open up it's okay to talk about it you will make a difference and i think it's just really hard for parents because they want to protect their son's privacy but at the same time i'm like you're you have to be the advocate because your son doesn't have a voice and so if he doesn't have the voice to advocate for himself then if his parents aren't advocating for him then who then you're, you're he's already at a disadvantage Uh, great job. Um, I had a question. I'm a prenatal counselor. Do you guys offer support groups for like expected um, patients who are maybe got a prenatal diagnosis or got an NIPT and want to talk to people? Yeah. So I, on the desk where registration is, I put out a bunch of cards. Um, they're, they're like, they have our, our logo. It, it says like, you're not alone on the back. It's a QR code that goes to our link tree. And on our link tree, it's got all of our information, it's Facebook support group, People can message us directly, email me directly. Um, I run the entire organization. So I do all the social media. I do all pretty much everything. Um, we are offering, um, we're going to start offering some kind of meetings where they're like Facebook lives where people, not Facebook lives, uh, like lives on Zoom where people can like reach out that way. But honestly, email, um, social media, that's how most people reach out. Or if, if you have my direct contact information, you can share that. Only in English, or you have other languages also? So only in English right now because um, it's we're a, we're a relatively new nonprofit, and just money and funding has not there. Um, our hope is within the next year or so to try to get our website to where it can be translated for any language in that aspect. Thank you so much. Yep, not a problem. Great, great talk. Um, I also do prenatal and. Honestly, I've always really struggled with talking about XXY, XYY, XXX with my patients. I know I have a personal bias. I call it a you know, mild chromosome problem. I, I, I don't think it's as severe as some of the other chromosome problems that we talk about. 
And um, it's hard when I'm talking with patients about it, I try to stay neutral from a scientific point of view. And as you mentioned, a lot of the articles out there, research always focuses on the, I think, most severe cases. Yeah. And a lot of times case studies are, are biased in that way because you only hear about the problems of a disorder. You don't hear about normal cases. Um, so I, I think I probably already know the answer to my question, but um, what is your experience given that you obviously live with it and also you've met a lot of people with it, um, how their life experiences compared to like what the research, what the, all the papers that you read, is it pretty inaccurate? Is there you know some accuracies or do you feel like it's very biased towards the most severe issues? Yeah, it's biased towards the most severe issues. Um, granted, yeah, kid, there are kids that have speech delay. I didn't have speech delay as a child. There are some kids that have speech delay, um, but then there's early intervention for that. And so we have a thing on our website where it, it lists like the states that cover it. There's still like nine states that don't cover Kleinfelder syndrome under their early intervention programs. We just changed Missouri. So that's, that's new. But when you're testing 25 people in a study, when there's thousands of us all over the world, and when 75% of us die never knowing, you have you have people out there that don't even know they have this. And so it's like, most of them are probably just living whatever normal life is for them. Granted, like, yeah, I have a high anxiety. I have depression, but who doesn't after COVID? I mean, like, you know, so so it's like, the, I think that, and then when it comes to health problems, like you're not studying a large enough group of people. And you're, if you're studying 30, like 30 or 20, I think one of the largest studies is coming out soon, the TESTO study by Denver, the Extraordinary Kids Clinic. We, we, we partnered with them. Um, but like micropenis and all these other aspects of the diagnosis, they're, they're like kind of kind of debunk some of that information. Um, and I know that's a big concern for mothers and just men in general. Um, and then a lot of the guys, a lot of the guys actually get diagnosed um, trying to have kids. And I have a ton of friends from that genre of guys because they've lived their life. They've have felt like they've had a brain fog their whole life, but they've never like put, put a kind of put a piece on it. And then when they get the diagnosis, they get on TRT and then their life like changes. And some of the guys do have a really hard time because they're like, how, how could no one, like, how could this go unnoticed? Um, especially with doctors, like having smaller testicles. You know, like um, doing your physical when you're younger to play sports. Like, how can that be missed? Stuff like that. And so I think, I mean, it's, there's not, the thing is, is like, there's not enough people in this community that are open about it. So then it, there's not enough information. There's not enough like money towards nonprofits where then we can make a difference for our community, especially for research. And so it's kind of like, it's kind of been like dead in the water since Harry Kleinfelter in, in 1942 diagnosed it. So we've had 80 years of basically misinformation running through our community, but nobody wants to, when you Google it and you see the photos and you see like the men standing like this with a black strip over their eye and they're naked and you see that and then you get diagnosed with this and you go in there and you look at it, are you going to want to open up about it and tell girls about dating that like look at it and they go, oh, I have a question. Do you have a micropenis? Like, like. But it's it's reality, right? It's it's true. I'm very blunt and honest, and I'm I'm that's just my life. So, I mean, I it's it's unfortunate that the research is out there, but I mean, it's also like we have to have research because we need to know about it, right? Kind of touched on. So, like, I had a patient who, you know, again, everybody's very Google savvy these days, so you're always kind of you know dealing with what have you researched, what have you looked up. But like they really brought up concerns over mental health. Like you brought up depression and anxiety. And, and one thing I kind of you know struggled with it with this research is, you know, how can they really say the depression or anxiety is due to having an extra X versus is it due to like you mentioned you were bullied, like because of the body shape or you being taller? Like, is it just due to you're diff a little bit different physically than your classmates? So bullying would cause anybody to have depression or anxiety. What's I mean, obviously you said, you know. COVID. I know this has kind of made everybody have it. There's, there's a video of me. It's the most popular video. I think it's got like five or 600,000 views where I'm just standing on the top of my house in, in uh, Mission Beach in San Diego where I live. And I did a video with my shirt off and I was just like, this is me. And I just turned around and there are so many comments of like, you look normal, dude. Like, like, so, so when it comes to body figure, I mean, yeah, there are guys in our community that do have gladicomastia that do, do have more pronounced, like larger hips and stuff like that. But it's, for, for that, 
it's those guys need to learn like self-acceptance. And I think that's been the biggest thing. My mission is like letting people know like parents in utero to accept the condition, tell your son about it early to accept it. Because if you, with any environment, if you don't accept yourself and you're trying to like fit in with whoever you are, but you're not really that person, then you're always, you're going to have a hard time. But when it comes to mental health, I mean, it's hard. It's, I don't, it's really hard to say. I did a study at the NIH in 2018. I have like a, a whole print here that went to MIT. Um, they did like an IQ test. And my IQ test was like way lower than what the normal average is. My parents were like, don't read it because you've survived, like you're 33 years old. You've survived this far without like your, your IQ test doesn't matter. Um, and so like, I think that there's, I mean, and I think also mental health, it's, it's, it's such a hard thing to, like I'm experiencing my own mental health, like right now with just going through doing this, talking about this constantly, you know, when I've lived my life and then now dealing with that, I think it's, it's definitely, like I said, it, I think there just needs to be more people that are open about it. that are willing to talk about it. But as, as you said, like, how do you know whether my experience is from anxieties from bullying when I was younger or the extra X it's, it's really hard to say, but I'm also not a doctor. <laughs> Thank you so You're much. You're welcome. We actually have three questions from virtual. The first is, do you partner with any genetic counselors or other providers? Um, we have a medical advisor from uh, Shanley Davis. She's the pediatric endocrinologist at the Extraordinary Kids Clinic in Denver, Colorado. Um, and then she's actually supported me since before I even started the organization. She believed in me and she knew that I was going to make a difference. Um, we don't have anyone that has kind of come forward. We're new. Um, and so we don't have any genetic counselors or anyone that kind of represents or wants to work with us, but we're open to it. Um, and I think that um, if, if people are open to it, we're, we're op yeah, we're open to it. Thank you. The next one is, as someone living with XXY, in your opinion, what would be an ideal one to two minute description of XXY for GCs to provide pregnant patients with a recent diagnosis on NIPC or minute. amnio? I only have 30 seconds left. Um, I, I honestly think images, images are more powerful than words. So if you can, if, if people can just share social media and, and share the stories and things online, um, granted, I mean, we, we, share every, we share all the spectrum of our community on, through photos. I think that if people can see that they're just a happy, like young little kid smiling, I think that makes a major difference um, knowing that there's people out there that have continued their pregnancy. But what would I say? I mean, you have... I, I'd have to get back to you on that one. I'm sorry. And then we have, if we have time, we have one more. Um, have you connected with groups for people with XYY or triple X, or would you consider, consider opening your group to them as well? So, I mean, I talk, so when I first started this, I've met kids, I've met 15 guys with XYY. I've met probably eight or nine guys with uh, 48 XXY, XXXY. Um, I've met like three, I think three kids with XYY. Um, so when I started this organization, there is another organization that's uh, open to like all the variations, but I, I have a lived experience of XXY. So I don't know what that lived experience is like having those other genetic conditions. And I feel like when you brought, when you, when you open up, especially when funding in our community is so low, um, I just took a salary last year for the first time and it's not for California standards at all, but, but, but it's, it's, it's in the process, right? So um, I think when you open it up to all that and you don't, you spread out your information and then, and then your your focus, your focus goes to other things. When my, my whole goal is like, I have this, I live with it. I know what it's like. I explain a lot of my life on YouTube and videos or through our podcast. And so I, that's, that's not going to be something in the future that will, we, it will be living with XXY um, nonprofit, but we do, 
I do connect a lot of people. I do play like the telephone game um, with parents and families that reach out to us. Um, we've got 37, we've got communities in 37 countries. So people that have reached out to us from all over the world. And I, I have a list of, of guys and families that have the other diagnoses um, where I kind of, if someone messages me, I'll connect them through, usually through social media or email, I'll to play the telephone game when I have the time to connect people together.